I'm delighted to introduce uh, Stephen McDonald, who is a currently a principal clinical scientist in the spe specialist hemostasis working at Cambridge University. Um, Stephen has over two decades of experience and knowledge that only today will be a small part of what he is able to share with us. He has spent a long time with a keen interest in statistical assessment of laboratory assay performance and clinical trials. He is focused on determination of uncertainty of measurement in specialist hemostasis arrays and developing models to best describe their performance. Stephen also carries out many roles uh, as well across the UK, as part of the steering committee for uh, KeyQuest, RICUS, UK NEQUEST, as well as being part of many publications over the last few years. Um, I will let Stephen take over. And just for everybody's information, this is obviously a hour long session. We will do our best to see if there is any time at the end for any questions or any discussion points. However, if we do not have time, we will take the questions that have been sent through the Q&A or through the chat and we will respond to them post the event. So thank you very much and over to you, Stephen. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, before we start, can we just confirm that you can hear me OK before I, before I make a start, Susan? Is, am I coming through loud and clear? Yep, I assume I am. Yep. OK, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the first of three planned sessions that we're going to talk about applied statistics in the medical laboratory. So as Susan said, I am Stephen MacDonald. I'm a clinical scientist in Ardenbrook's Hospital in Cambridge. Um, you may have guessed already by my voice that I am not native to Cambridge. Uh, I come from this lovely place in the picture on the left hand side, uh, Inverness in the Highlands of Scotland. Uh, and for the last 20 years, I've worked uh, in the building on the right hand side, Ardenbrook's Hospital in Cambridge. I've developed a keen interest in statistics and how they're applied in the laboratory particularly. Um, and it, it's going to be an introduction to, to some of that today that I'm going to try and uh, portray across to, to the people that have attended with the view that I, I think statistics are everywhere in everything that we do in the laboratory. And I feel that there's a real problem with the profession at the time just now and that we have a real lack of education and, and basics of the statistics of, of what we're doing and applying. A lot of that being due to the advent of uh, much improved software and computer programs so that a lot of the calculations that we used to perform by hand are now done by computers. So I hope that today I'm going to give you perhaps a different way of looking at statistics that we use in the laboratory um, and I'll give you a bit of insight about how we model our analytical processes and use them to ultimately improve patient care. So we'll start with a high level thought of what are statistics used for in general and, and statistics are not one single thing. There are a whole wealth of different techniques and methods which can be used and applied in a lot of different contexts. We can apply statistics for description of data that we generate and to classify patients as having a disease or not having a disease. We use it to compare methods, to compare results within patients and between patients. And often we perform statistical inference, and by that I usually mean whether results are significant or not. More and more so now, we are moving into the realms of prediction and explanation, machine learning, artificial intelligence, all have a sound grounding in statistics. And I think a lot of the the trepidation that we have in, in laboratories and sinus in general is trying to work out what approach we need to take in order to understand statistics that are used. And that may well come from when we do any sort of tests or we do any sort of projects or anything, we we'll invariably try and work out what statistics we try and try and need to use in order to understand our data. And I've just used this slide here as an example of if you Google what statistical method do I need, there is an absolute wealth of potential methods that we can use for different applications. I think this is a great, great slide. I'm showing this slide because it's actually one of the clearer ones. But I think that really leads to a misconception of, of what statistics are and how we use them in the laboratory. And what I'd like to do today is to try and approach it in a different way 
and try and show that how basic common statistical methods that we use in the laboratory help us to develop a, a better understanding of what's required for the management and the attainment of standardization of laboratory methods. Because ultimately, standardization of laboratory methods is what improves patient care and allows us to have the assurance that we are providing the right result to the right patient at the right time of an adequate quality. So this diagram here um, is from a publication in 2014 describing the temple of standardization, if you like. And it shows that there's a lot of different components which are contained within um, the standardization methodology, which allow us to be able to hold these all together and to improve the quality of our patient results. Starting from the left, we talk about metrological traceability, be that through reference methodology and reference materials. And we'll be talking about that over the next three sessions. Invariably, assurance of our quality of our results through accreditation activities, which varies worldwide how we are accredited and what schemes we're accredited to, and even what guidelines we're accredited to. And ultimately, the goal of standardization is to get to the point where our methods are sufficiently similar and are sufficiently standardized that we can use common reference intervals and common decision limits so that the results in patients across centers and across countries ultimately will be comparable. And there are different models that we can use to be able to monitor the standards of our quality and also to determine whether they're clinically appropriate. And some of them are here, so internal quality control and measurement uncertainty, as well as the total error paradigm um, are also used. All of these things have statistics at the core of them. And it's really important to consider how we need to understand the statistics that feed into these processes in order for us to be able to be able to standardize our methods. So you probably saw when you signed up that there was a number of learning outcomes about what we were hoping to discuss. Um, common statistical methods such as standard deviations, coefficient of variations, uh, and how that ties in with our measurement of random errors, systematic errors. And ultimately, we're going to discuss what these statistics, where they come from, how the data is generated, what the statistics mean, what the, what the goal of those statistics are, and then how we can apply them to models within the laboratory in order to achieve our goals. And an important starting point is to realize that ultimately in the medical laboratory, every measurement that we perform, irrespective of what discipline you come from, all measurements are statistical in nature. And that means from a context of statistical theory, we are sampling by taking blood samples, urine samples from patients, and we're testing different measurands within that sample. And we're trying to extrapolate that to the physiological processes within the patient and ultimately trying to determine either diagnosis or prognosis or progression of disease or things like that. Now, in order for those results to have any sort of meaning, they have to be traceable because if we're talking about numeric results, we'll talk about a number followed by a unit. And that means what that gives us in traceability, that gives us a common language to discuss those results. And that's a common language between us and the laboratory and our clinicians, but also between different centers, ultimately worldwide in the peer reviewed literature. So we're trying to relate something that we measure locally and extrapolate that into a, into a whole patient and trying to liken that to what could be done at any point anywhere around the world. But what we do, we do know is that when we are measuring any given measure and we get that numeric result with a unit assigned to it, there is going to be an element of error in every measurement. And what that means is that although we have a defined numerical result, that is actually, that's our best estimate of what the result is. That's not an absolutely deterministic value that we have. So when we start talking about best estimates, or to use a statistical term, an expectation of the result that we're getting, we have to have a, me a means of handling how that result is processed. So the elements of error that may be contained within any result, these may be systematic error, or random error. And these are probably terms that are quite familiar to the, those of you that are on the call just now. 
looking at the diagram on the right hand side, if we imagine a mythical true value, that's what we're intending to measure. I say it's mythical because we can never, using our, using our measurement, measurement methods, um, determine what the true value is. But if we look at that as the blue line here, there will be an element of systematic error, which means that the result that we measure is slightly away from that true value. And the fact that we're doing uh, a single measurement means that we are actually measuring something that could be within a range of different values. And what we're doing is measuring the best estimate. So there's going to be systematic influences which shift that result away from the true value, and there's going to be random influences which change probabilistically how we interpret that result. So let's put this into an everyday context. If, if we think about baking cookies, and you can have the best recipe in the world um, for making cookies, but we know that if we don't follow our processes correctly, and if we don't control our processes correctly, the end result, so the, the quality of the cookies at the end, might vary significantly. So, for example, a systematic error in this recipe might be if you use corn flour instead of plain flour. Plain flour. And if you do that consistently, you're always going to get the wrong result. You're never going to get the desired outcome. You're always going to get something different from what you'd originally planned to get. And that's because of a systematic change in the process as it was designed to be. Equally, if you had four eggs instead of one egg, or if you use large eggs instead of medium sized eggs. So those systematic changes, those systematic errors are going to directly impact how the end result occurs. With the actual cooking process, we are going to be subject to random fluctuations because of things like the temperature of the oven. You'll get a different result um, based on the oven that you got. Your, your temperature of your oven will fluctuate. So there's going to be random things that we're not able to control that are going to be consistently uh, within that process that are going to affect the final result. So as an example of systematic and random influences into an overall process, we need to work out how can we control for that. If we have identified systematic error, we can try and correct for that. So if we use the wrong sort of flour and we realise that our end product is incorrect, we can correct for that by using the correct amount of flour. So systematic error loosely speaking, and we'll talk about the theory about this later, can be corrected for if we can identify that systematic error. Whereas random error is a little bit more unpredictable, we can never correct for it completely, but we can reduce it. So really, ultimately, a goal in our processes is statistically to reduce the random error to a significant uh, amount so that the precision is at really a good level which also allows us to be able to detect any bias in our process more readily because if we have a lot of random error in there the presence of bias gets somewhat clouded by the fact that it's overrun by the by the random error so the question is statistically how do we how do we reduce our random error and this isn't something that is new to us this is something that has been around for many millennia of years and I'm a big fan of the work that was done by the ancient Egyptians for obvious reasons. How they managed to build those pyramids is beyond me. But they used the concept of an average, and they used an average um, in the context of the ability of the workers that were available to them to build the pyramids. And they grouped them into groups where they had an average standard of work across every, every group that was contributing to developing the pyramids. Many thousands of years later, the concept of the average in measurements was really taken forward by uh, this picture on the right hand side, Adrien Marie Legendre, who unfortunately for them, um, this is the only existing portrait for them. Um, I don't think it does them many favours, but they were the first person to realise that there had to be a better way of summarising measurements, which reduced the amount of error which was associated with taking that measurement. And they introduced um, the concept of minimising the sum of the squares of the differences between the average and the observed values. So that's quite a mouthful. So if we look at that as an example, if we take this as a just as a random number line and we take five different measurements, each of a different quantity, 
in order to work out what the average is, we have to start somewhere. We have to work out what could be the average, what could be the mean. And if I place the mean on that number line there, I'm sure you're probably going to look at that and think, well, that's not really where the mean should be. And that's right. That gives us a starting point, though. And what that does is it allows us to quantify the difference between the measured result and what we're calling the mean as the summary statistic. They will both be positive and negative, um, and the size of these arrows indicates the degree of error between the summary measure, the mean, and the actual observed measurements that we have. So it's important to notice that the description of the measurement that we're making is by the mean, but we are never actually measuring that number. We are summarizing that based on the data that we've collected. By quantifying the, um, the size of these arrows, we can then try and optimize where we place the mean. So here it looks a little bit better, it's nearer the middle, as we would expect. And we can see that the size of those arrows are somewhat smaller. So we've reduced the amount of error, which is in the statistic demonstrated by the mean. And that's something conceptually that we don't often think about, that when we're talking about the mean and its use in the laboratory, that is the number which minimizes the amount of error between the data that we've collected and the summary statistic that we're using to describe our process. And the mean is used throughout clinical laboratories, so it's really useful to know and understand why, why that concept has been developed. Now, the mean is a measure of central tendency, and of course, there are others. So the median is the central value if they're all lined up in order. And if we took another measurement and got the same value, the mode would be the other measure of central tendency. But I think in, in our laboratories, we tend to use the mean more often than not. And the reason for that is based around normally distributed data, which we'll touch on in a short while. So when talking about statistics, it wouldn't be a talk without um, showing some sort of weird and wonderful calculation. And if I asked anybody what the mean or how to calculate the mean, you would very simply say to me, you add up all your measurements and divide it by the number of measurements. But this is how it's depicted formulaically. So the bar indicates that an average has been calculated. The Greek symbol sigma means that we're adding things together. And we start at the first measurement and continue to the end or to the last measurement, however many that is, taking the value of each individual measurement and dividing it by the number of samples that are actually taken. So that I value is usually what confuses people when they see things. Knowing the language of statistics is really helpful when you're reading papers or reading things that are trying to explain how to calculate stuff. Being able to break it down is really a useful skill to have. So that I is represented actually just means each individual measurement gets a separate um, gets a separate number as we go through the algorithm. And this is, of course, a representation of the arithmetic mean. There are other means available. Um, so the geometric mean is one that we use in hemostasis for calculating calculating the mean normal prothrombin time for our INR, INR calculation. The reason I wanted to show this was. The statistics that we use in the laboratory are inexquisitely, <laughs> they're very much related. I can't remember what the big word is I was going to say. They're very much related to what the underlying data generating process is. So although we might use the mean all the time, sometimes we need to think, actually, is that representing the, the generating process of the data? So the geometric mean, for example, is used when the measurements are not independent. So if there's correlations between the measurements and if there's large fluctuations between measurements. So this time it uses the product of all the individual measurements and then raises that to the inverse of the power of the number of measurement of the number of measurements that are taken. So we add all the, all the measurements together and then route them together. So as a measure of a statistical measure of our processes, we use the mean and quality control and, and, and various other different things. What other statistical measures might be useful to us? So if we go back to our cookie analogy, if we say that we measure the mean value of the number of chocolate chips in these cookies, that gives us a, an understanding of what the expectation we should get for every cookie is. 
But how much does that vary? Is it always going to be the same or is it going to be different? So we need another sort of statistical measure to be able to describe how those chocolate chips in the cookie are going to be are going to be distributed. And that is done by something called the standard deviation. So the standard deviation, going back to our original graphs on here, basically gives us a measure of the variability of our sample of data. And you can see the red, the blue and the green all look different here. So going back to our original data set, if we have set on our mean and we know that this mean value has minimized the amount of error between each of those results and the assigned value, we can then quantify the size of these arrows. So that gives us a way of describing how good the data set is or how good or how close the data that we measured is to that mean which has been um, generated. What's important to notice is that as the standard deviation increases, this distribution widens, but also the expectation or the probability of that mean value occurring reduces with a wider standard deviation. And we'll come to that in a second. So formulaically, we've got a different equation here. We're looking at a square root sign. The sigma value again, which is um, telling us that we're adding things together, but we're adding different things together. This xi represents each individual measurement, and we're taking each individual measurement and taking away the value for the sample mean. So the sample mean feeds directly into the standard deviation. So we know that reducing error gives us our mean, and we know that we can then quantify the reduction in that error by using the standard deviation through this part of the equation. We then divide that by something called the degrees of freedom, which is the number of samples taken minus one. The square root sign allows us to calculate a standard deviation within the box. If we didn't square root it, that's what's called the variance. Um, and that's quite often what you will hear people talking about when they talk about variability of data. The variance is related to the standard deviation quite simply by the standard deviation being the square root of the variance. So that's a very quick run through of two very simple, very commonly used statistics, but looking at it in a different way from the aspect of reducing error within um, the data which is being collected. And that really opens up a wealth of possibilities about what we can actually do with our processes now. So for the standard deviation through something called the empirical rule, we know that if the common bell-shaped curve as we see here is in place, we know that 68.3% of our samples that we take from that normal distribution will be within one standard deviation of the mean result, assuming that the mean has been calculated by reducing error. Furthermore, by increasing that to two standard deviations, we can then contain 95.5% of our data. So you'll often hear the mythical or, or the magical 95% uh, confidence intervals or ranges or things. That's where it comes from. This is an empirical rule because it is generated through uh, measurement observations. It's not necessarily purely theoretical. It can be demonstrated um, in practice. And that was really nicely done by this gentleman on the left here, Sir Francis Galton, a very eminent um, scientist in the late 1800s who in 1874 presented an experiment, a very simple experiment, to a meeting of the Royal Society in London in 1874, where he demonstrated using something called the Galton board on the right-hand side, that if you fill small ball bearings into the top of this Galton board and push them through this aperture, when the balls come in contact with all of these different pins, there will be random bouncing of the balls and it will determine which direction it goes. If you use enough ball bearings within this Galton board, it will always fall into a normal distribution, as is shown in this picture here. That is possibly one of the most important concepts to think about when we're talking about statistics. The principle of randomness and the accumulation of individual random events, which the bouncing of these pins does, means that the formation of the normal distribution allows us to describe accumulation of lots of things that are caused by random events. 
This might be genetic mutations. This might be contributors to uncertainties in our result. This normal distribution becomes extremely important in science because it collects all of the random individual effects and pulls them into something that we can describe mathematically through this equation here, which please don't try and remember, but through an accumulation of a lot of work done in the 1700s and 1800s by Abraham de Mauvre in the top right, Pierre Simon Laplace in the, on the left, and um, Carl Friedrich Gauss on the bottom right here, came up with this probability distribution to describe the normal distribution. And that describes all of these random processes that are described by the normal distribution in nature. And the magical thing is, the only two pieces of information you need to describe the normal distribution is either the standard deviation or the variance as the case here, and the mean. So that is an extremely powerful thing. Remembering that the mean and the standard deviation are based upon reduction of error in the summarization of data. Now, the mean that we're using and the standard deviation that we're using within uh, our normal distribution will have a degree of variability in them as well, because any test that we do, we are sampling data to try and describe the population. So another extremely powerful concept that has a lot of applications in clinical laboratories is that of the standard error. And that tells us when we calculate the mean for a sample size, how much does that mean move around and how confident are we that we are describing the population mean within that range? So going back to our cookie example again, um, if our manufacturer guarantees a number of chocolate chips per cookie per packet, how much does that vary based on their the quality of their processes that they are that they are producing? And equally, if we think about our internal quality control in the lab, how much does our mean value vary? What's the confidence of the mean value that we are assigning and that we are actually running at? Um, and that can be described by this equation here, by the standard error. And you'll see immediately, this is again derived from the standard deviation, which as a reminder is this equation here, and by the number of samples taken. And this is a common question whenever we're doing anything in the laboratory, if we're doing method comparisons, if we're doing verifications, things like that. How many samples do I need to test to be sure that I am going to get a reliable statistical result? And that is ultimately under underpinned by the quantification of this standard error and the confidence of the parameter that we're generating. So I'm sure many of you will have heard of the 20 and 30 samples as making things tend towards the normal distribution. And in the bottom right here is a little simulation that I did quantifying the standard error of an estimate based on the number of samples that are tested. And you can see that 20 or 30 samples here gets us down to where we're going with this plateau level. Um, so that's often why you'll see the, the number of 30 quoted. Once we get down to the 50, 60, 70 level, you see it plateaus off and we're subject to something called the law of diminishing returns, where we put a lot of effort into collecting an awful lot of samples and actually we're reducing the standard error of our estimate by a very small amount. Now, we do know that there's lots of guidelines in the literature that suggest 100 to 120 samples for a lot of the statistical methods that we do in the lab very strong statistical basis for doing that but we do need to balance how we manage that financially and logistically in the laboratory as well to be able to achieve that and we need to understand what those numbers are actually telling us and they're very well explained particularly in the CLSI documents that this is the sample number required and this is why and the standard error ultimately gives us something that we can calculate, which is used throughout medical laboratory statistics, that being the confidence interval. So the CI is the confidence interval, X bar is the sample mean, so that is our estimate of the sample mean based upon the sample of data that we've provided. A confidence interval will give us an upper limit and a lower limit, and we apply what's called a Z value, 
which basically allows us to say how confident we are of the estimate and the range that we're giving. But then you'll see our old friends, the standard deviation and the sample size and the ultimately the standard error here. So we've started from the mean and now we're now at the point of generating confidence intervals. So the mean limits error um, or reduces, optimizes the reduction of error to give us our best estimate. That mean is used in the standard deviation calculation to quantify our error. The standard deviation is then used based on the number of samples that we've used to give us a range around that estimate to tell us um, how confident we are of that, that um, estimate that we've got. Ultimately, the, the standard error gives us an understanding of the imprecision of the estimate that we've made. And imprecision is definitely a topic that we are familiar with in the laboratory. So the coefficient of variation is a common statistic and a very popular statistic that is used to describe precision within the laboratory. Um, but importantly, and probably less well known is the fact that it's also known as a relative standard deviation. So it's derived from a standard deviation. Again, you can see that on the bottom and the mean generated in the same way we've discussed before. But that gives us a measure of the imprecision at a specific point in our measurement range. Now, one question I often get asked is, what's the coefficient of variation of your test? That's not a simple question to answer. Um, the reason being that your coefficient of variation isn't necessarily constant across your entire measurement range. And that can be determined by something called your precision profile. And we know that at the bottom end of some tests, the precision is terrible. The, the precision is much better at the high end. What's really important is what the coefficient of variation is at the clinical decision limits, because ultimately that determines how clinical utility of the test is used. So the CV will describe the variability around a specific point being measured and making that concentration specific and therefore linked to clinical decision limits if we're fortunate enough to have the data around there. It is not measurement uncertainty. Despite what people say, despite what people may have said in the past and are continuing today to be saying, it is not measurement uncertainty. If your CV was measurement uncertainty, it would be called measurement uncertainty. OK, measurement uncertainty has many different moving parts. It does include measurements of imprecision, which we'll discuss later, but it's not the same thing. We can use the coefficient of variation in many different applications, and I'm sure you'll be uh, pr probably familiar with many of these. So we, we like to think of intra and inter assay coefficient of variations. And these give us different pieces of information about our test methodologies. So an intra assay CV is likened to repeatability. So when we have a single sample tested on a single assay under the same conditions, so there's a much limited amount of variation that will come into our method because we're measuring it over a short period of time. So that allows us to measure the variation in results that occur due to factors within a single test run. And that's extremely useful information for us when we're verifying methodologies, but also when we're running our patient samples through there as well, because it aids us with interpretation. This is in contrast to inter assay CVs, which measures the consistency and the reliability of results under different measurement conditions. So across different runs, across different days, or even possibly across different instruments. And what we normally do when we're verifying instruments, so we're implementing a new method into the laboratory, is we will run a combination of these. We will run them both, probably through a five by five by five protocol. And then that will give us information about what our variability is in an individual run and what it's like over a longer period of time. Both metrics have similarities and differences. Um, and the coefficient of variation is common as a metric as giving you a percentage variation um, across so as a measure of a scatter or a spread of results around the mean that we're measuring. They're always um, expressed as a percentage and a percentage of what the mean value is at that level. Um, and it's really they're both essential for 
comparing the quality of our result before we implement it into routine practice. The differences, as I alluded to in the previous slide, is that one will do a single run, one will do across multiple runs across different days and different um, different analyzers potentially. So you would absolutely expect that your interassay precision would be larger than your intra because the amount of contributors which could cause variation in your results would be more than you would see in a single run in a very short period of time. And ultimately, by measuring our variation, it allows us to quantify our reproducibility and the comparability of our results. So again, going back to the cookie analogy, how, how consistent can we make our bakes in a given day? So multiple bakes in a given day within one, uh, within one kitchen, um, over different days, or across different factories, different sites, and different, ki and different kitchens within that because the variability with that will ultimately determine what the what the quality of the process is. So our CVs allow us to do that both on an individual analyzer basis and an individual method basis, but also across things like network laboratories, large hospital networks, which might be across very large geographical areas, comparing and contrasting performance across those um, ranges of activities is something that is extremely useful. We can also um, consider what the, co the comparison of a single patient over time is. So is there a significant change in a patient result over time? And is that due to analytical variability? And we're going to talk about that more in the second session in a few weeks time. Um, and this is very different when we talk about repeatability and reproducibility from the impact for a diagnostic specimen in a patient, which is impacted through the other level of error that can be introduced into assays, which is systematic error and bias. So as we saw in a previous diagram, the de degree by which our measured value differences from the expected or the true value quantifies the amount of bias in our assay. We have to be very careful about how we measure that. Um, and the, the amount of bias that we have in our assays will never, ever be precise. And it will never be 100% um, confirmed to be zero either. So if anybody says that their methods have absolutely zero bias, that statistically can't be the case. Because what the expected value in the blue is, and the, and the measured value in the green is, will invariably be described by these statistical distributions. And bias isn't one single thing. Bias can come in different forms. We can have constant or proportional bias. If we're comparing two things, we imagine that in an ideal world, we get exactly the same result across both methods. We would see this yellow line. If we have, any, have a constant bias so that one method is consistently away from another, we would see this green line where it runs parallel, but shifted to the side. That's different from the red line here, which is a proportional bias, which shows that as the as the value of the measure and that we're measuring increases, the deviation from what we expect of the true value increases as well. So we need to be sure that this um, quantification of proportional bias and constant bias is, is considered in all aspects of, of how we manage that. And then the often forgotten part about bias is what's the significance of the bias? So if I say we can never eradicate all of our bias, there's always going to be some bias present compared to reference methodologies or reference materials. We need to ultimately consider that in the in the context of the clinical impact of the patient and the risk of a poor patient outcome based on um, bias being present in our tests. There are statistical methods which can be used um, to measure uh, the significance of the bias, so things such as the t-test, developed by probably the, the least known but most um, deserving person in statistical history for developing tests. This is uh, William Seeley Gossett, who developed the t-test, commonly known as the student t-test. Um, he published the invention of the t-test um, under the pseudonym of student because he worked for Guinness at the time and wanted to work out a methodology for comparing the quality of the hops for large production processes in Guinness um, and developed the t-test. Um, so the t-test 
can be used to measure to see if two things differ by a given amount or if it differs from zero by a given amount. And that can be either the paired or the one sample t-test is uh, in order there. But what I wanted to show by the equation was that even using statistical methods like t-tests, we are still going back to measuring means and measuring standard deviations and characterizing, quantifying and minimizing error as much as possible. So the impact of this significant bias, so we can either find a statistically significant bias and we can determine whether that's a, a clinically significant bias. We need to conceptualize what does that actually mean for patients? So reference intervals are, are, are a hot topic and how we determine reference intervals. There are a number of different methods of doing it. If we take just purely as an example, um, taking let's just say some normal donors and taking the central 95% of those normal donors and calculating a range using confidence intervals, standard deviations and means, um, we know that the central 95% of our population will be contained within that range and 2.5% of normal people will be out with that range just statistically. And as long as our method is reduced as far as bias is concerned, we know that this is the case. If we then introduce some bias into our assay, we shift that distribution away from where we were when we were talking about our normal reference population. And as a consequence, this yellow triangle at the tail of the distribution exponentially increases massively. And what that means is that we're in a significant risk of misclassifying patients as being abnormal when they're not abnormal purely because of the bias that's present in our method. So as an example, if we introduce a 0.5 um, standard even deviation bias into our method, 10% of patients will be out with that reference range. If we increase that to one, then that will be 20%. So that has a real significant impact on the risk of poor patient outcome by misclassifying patients. Because bear in mind, we're also going to be classifying people as normal when potentially they're abnormal in the other side of that tail as well. So can we put numbers onto our bias and can we quantify that? Usually in the laboratory, we can quantify bias in a number of different ways. If we're fortunate enough to have certified reference materials, so uh, a material with an assigned value by a National Meteorology Institute, we can measure our bias compared to that. But more commonly, we'll use external quality assurance and more and more of our EQA schemes will start using metrics such as the Z score and the SDI score to give us an indication of where we are as a, a, as a laboratory compared to our peers who are running the same methodologies. So if we look at our measured results that we will submit to our external quality assurance and take away the assigned value, so that might be a consensus value through the EQA scheme, or an expected value that's measured by a reference method. Um, and the difference of that divided by, again, our standard deviation, we can work out how many standard deviations away from the expected value we are. And we can put a statistical number on that to tell us whether that is acceptable or not. And if we're within minus two and plus two standard deviations, so a Z score of between minus two and two, we can say that we're within specification greater than those limits of two and minus two, we need to investigate it and require attention because we're not within the central 95% of the population as expected. If we're greater than three or less than minus three, it requires urgent attention and we really need to be troubleshooting that very, very quickly. So that gives us a method from EQA, but we can also use that now in internal quality control as well because we can do peer group uh, comparisons through a uh, submission to software, which is provided by manufacturers to see where our mean group or, or, or the mean of our quality control is lying compared to the, our peers that are using the same methods and reagent lots as well. So that can give us an indication of any presence of bias within our system. So the question is, how do we use these statistics in models of performance? Means, standard deviations, coefficient of variations, 
confidence intervals, all of these things. They're all very nice as standalone things, but how do we tie them all together in models of performance? And you can't do any talk without discussing models without mentioning George Box. Um, his most famous quote is, um, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. Um, this is a slight elaboration on that in a publication that he published in 1976. But it's worth knowing and it's worth reminding some people that no one model is correct. There's no one size fits all. Every model that we can use in the laboratory has its pros, has its cons. How we manage that and we manage the risk of those pros and cons determines how we manage our, our analytical control. So if we think about models, I suppose the main model or the, the most prominent model that we can think about us using is internal quality control. So internal quality control um, is derived from a long time ago in the 1930s from um, the, the originate, originator of statistical process control here, Walter Schuhart in the 1930s, who worked in Bell Laboratories and was tasked in improving the quality of um, transcontinental telegraph um, communications in, in the United States and trying to detect any errors that were occurring in that, any trying to predict any faults that were going to occur so they could fix them before they happened and just generally monitoring the process. And he invented something called the Schuhart chart, which was um, modified in the 1950s into probably the more familiar term that you'll know in the bottom right-hand corner called the Levy Jennings chart that we use to monitor our internal quality control. So by using consistent, so that as much as is possible, commutable internal quality control to measure the analytical process in our system, we have means statistically to detect our bias and our random error within that within that process. So by measuring where our running mean is and comparing that to where our expected target mean is, we can determine whether our systems are shifted slightly away from what the expectation is, bearing in mind that the target mean will, by definition, have a standard error, so the standard deviation over the square root of n, so that will have a range around that mean that we will expect most places to, to land within. It's worth noting that the kit inserts for internal quality control when they provide a mean, uh, when they provide a range of expected, expected values, will variably to talk about that is the range that the mean needs to fall in. It's not a measure of the variability that is expected within that test. And that is determined by the standard error. We can also do the Z score in the SDI through our peer review QC. And for random error, we can measure it based on our variance or our variability using the standard deviation, um, which gives us a measure of our reproducibility, intermediate precision, which I'll tell you about the, the differentiation between those terms in a minute. And also something called the coefficient of variation index from our peer group, um, which is coming up. This internal quality control model itself is the basis upon which we build on other models. So total error, um, rules that are based on total error and measurement uncertainty are also based on the data that we are able to generate from our internal quality control processes. So the simple mean and standard deviation that we are applying to our IQC processes are very, very important for ultimately determining whether we think our assays are appropriate for clinical utility or not. So if we go to the first model that, that is fed into from the IQC model, we can go into the Sigma-based system, um, which is a system that was originally developed by Motorola, um, a manufacturing company who were trying to improve the production standards of uh, telecommunication equipment, so electronic pagers and telephones, and they were realizing that they were spending a lot of time and effort producing these products and ultimately they, at the end they would pick up a phone and try and make a phone call and it didn't work so there was a lot of time and effort and expenditure used um, which stopped uh, which meant that that was a very inefficient process so the sigma metric um, introduced sampling of the production process and allowed it to detect how many defects per units produced were acceptable um, and by minimizing that, it was able to give it a number which, which describes the variability in the process, which means that 
the number tells you the quality of the process. This is through the number that this is through is the Sigma metric. The Sigma metric has been adopted in medical laboratories, primarily through Dr. Westgard, who has done decades of amazing work in improving the way the quality control is done within clinical laboratories. And the model that is applied for the Sigma metric within the laboratories is to take the total allowable error. So that's an analytical performance specification. We will talk about how they are derived in the second talk um, that I do. The amount of bias and dividing that by the standard deviation. So again, those common statistics that we talked about in the beginning um, are creeping up again. The standard deviation be generated from um, verification studies, validation studies, or on an ongoing basis from our internal quality control performance. How is this Sigma metric uh, calculated? You have an amount of error that you're allowed. So let's say 20. Um, I've set the bias to zero. It's a little bit tongue in cheek knowing what I've said previously. And the imprecision, so the SD is the measure of the imprecision is five. And then we use this simple calculation, 20 minus zero divided by five to give us a Sigma value of four. The minimum, we should be by this model trying to achieve in a clinical laboratory is a sigma level of three and world-class quality is aiming for a sigma level of six. A sigma level of six tells us how many standard deviations of our process do we have wriggle room between the absolute limits of our process um, acceptability. So how is this used? How do we use this in everyday operations? Um, again, um, to emphasise the work that we've done by Dr. Westgard in, in, in the past uh, and continually at the, as well. Um, by using um, the Sigma score and the amount of systematic error which is present in the system, he developed with colleagues something um, called a power function graph, which allowed us to determine what is the statistical power to detect an unacceptable performance in our test through our internal quality control based on applying a number of different rules. It's very complex. It's amazingly important work that has been done. Um, and, and these power function curves, you can work your way through, or gratefully, what we can do is look at the really nice diagrams that have been provided. So this information is available on the WasteGuard website, wasteguardqc.com, but it gives us an indication of the quality of our test dictating what the what number and combination of rules that we use for our internal quality control we apply to each test on a test by test basis. Um, that has really been a paradigm shift from the way that quality control was previously done in the 1970s and before, where pooled patient samples were used to control um, local tests. And we were very much controlling the local laboratory performance the development of the Westgard rules, the Sigma rules, um, and, and the other iterations after that means that we have a much stronger statistical model to be able to measure the performance of our tests, again, locally. Because internal quality control for a long, long time was done in the silos of our own tests. That has moved forward somewhat now with, as I mentioned before, the implementation of peer review QC. So most manufacturing companies will provide a platform to do this. So you can compare your coefficient of variation from your internal quality control and compare that to what the coefficient of variation to the rest of the people in the world potentially are running at. And ideally, of course, as you're running on a very small system compared to the whole world, you should be looking for a CVI of less than one because your variability in your system should be less than all of that variability across other methods. So I think what I'm trying to show here is that there's been an evolution of the process from very rudimentary patient based sample um, quality control to more statistical, um, statistically powerful quality control to now worldwide comparisons and quality control. But what it does is we need to work out a better way of comparing ourselves across the world. Because what we're doing with the CVI is we're comparing just our imprecision. And the imprecision is only part of our story about um, our performance across um, the different methods. 
And this is where a potential option for, uh, or a potential other model for describing this uh, comes into play. And this is the measurement uncertainty model, um, which is basically measurement uncertainty is a non-negative parameter characterizing the dispersion of any measured results based on what information has been put into that calculation. And what that does is it gives us a range around our measured value that we can expect probabilistically the measured value to occur. Now, where this differs slightly is that this as a central concept has metrological traceability contained within it. And metrological traceability is important for comparability of results by doing that through a calibration hierarchy to a common standard. So that initial measurement that has a number and has a unit assigned to it is therefore only meaningful if that is common to a single standard at the beginning. And measurement uncertainty model manages that through the use of things called standard uncertainties. So for our internal quality control, our imprecision measured by the, the standard deviation, um, happily, the standard uncertainty is the equivalent of the standard deviation of RQC, not the CV, the standard deviation. Um, now, based on what um, the underlying generating process is, you might have to do some statistical fudge factors to get into a standard uncertainty. But as long as our internal quality control, and by that I mean the results are normally distributed, which they should always be, then we can use the standard deviation of RQC as our standard uncertainty and measurement uncertainty. And we call that standard deviation taken over a, over a long period of time, minimum of six months, intermediate precision. So this is different from repeatability and is different from reproducibility. Uh, and that allows us to take the variability within our system due to all sources of random variation. So what does that mean? Let's go back to Francis Galton. We talked about all sources of random variation within our our process being characterized by a normal distribution. If our internal quality control is described by the bell-shaped curve, the normal distribution, then we can statistically assume that the sources of a random variation are captured by that normal distribution of our, inter our, our internal quality control results. This includes things like lot-to-lot -lot changes. This includes calibrations. This includes changes in operators. How it handles bias, is still up for debate. That that's still a bone of contention. But graphically, um, this is shown really quite nicely because the total variation in our analytical processes may look something like the bottom curve here on on the chart, where there's a lot of bouncing around and some shifts and some drifts, and they can be contributed to by within day, day to day calibration, region lot, all sorts of different variable um, effects. And what that means is if we collect our internal quality control over a prolonged enough period of time, we can capture all of that variability that propagates to final patient results. And we can add that through the measure of metrological traceability, which we can quantify by how close we are to a reference material or a reference method. Metrological traceability is an entire talk of its own. So what that reference standard that we're comparing ourselves against, what the uncertainty of the assigned value to that is, um, because ultimately that international standard or that reference material will be the basis upon which our manufacturers assign our calibrator values that ultimately they send to us. So they will give us a calibrator with a value of 100 and a potential uncertainty between 95 and 105 that is determined by the standard or the relation to the calibration hierarchy that we have um, for that metrological traceability chain. So we have two slightly different but somewhat similar methods as well, models for ass assessing um, performance of our, met of our methods within the laboratory. Um, we have the total error and measurement uncertainty concepts, both of which use different statistical measures, measures to combine them. Uh, and we'll talk about that in the second session, talking about analytical performance specifications. Um, the big difference, total error has bias as a central concept to that. Measurement uncertainty has had a number of explanations as to how bias fits in, but still we're looking for a proper answer to that yet. 
Um, but the linear combination against the root sum of squares methodology also conceptually has differences about how we apply these models in the clinical laboratory. We will talk about that in the second session, which hopefully you will be able to attend. Um, importantly, these two models are used for comparing methods for clinical utility. So how we use these methods ultimately to improve patient outcome by improving our methods. Um, but other ways that we can compare our performance is um, through method comparison studies. And in the last two or three slides, I just wanted to debunk a statistical myth that seems to have been with us for decades within clinical laboratories, and that is how to appropriately quantify method comparison studies. We go back on the left here to a picture of Sir Francis Galton, again on the, on the right. Um, who worked very, very closely with Carl Pearson in London. And in fact, Francis Galton um, left some money in his will to set up a statistical laboratory in UCL in London, which Carl Pearson was the head of. Um, and Carl Pearson basically invented inferential statistics, what we commonly understand to be statistics. And while measuring, believe it or not, skulls in the Paris catacombs, he was trying to work out whether the size of the skull correlated with whether they were male or female. And he wasn't very happy that the size of the skull was ex was able to explain whether the, the skull came from a male or female. And the term was generated from his work, but wasn't applied to him, was correlation is not causation. And I'm sure that's something that many, many people have heard. I want to change that phrase slightly. Correlation is not comparability. Correlation is not agreement. Correlation is often used to determine whether two methods in a method comparison study are the same and equivalent. It is not designed as a statistical method to do that. I've done a, a small simulation with some data I generated in our lab with method A and method B. And if everybody, as is quite often the case, takes the R squared and 0.95 as being acceptable, um, that only tells them that as one method gives a higher result, the other method also gives a higher result. If you do the same experiment, but you double the result of one method compared to the other, the R squared comes out exactly the same. Now, those methods don't compare, certainly not numerically. Um, so we have to be very careful about how we use statistics, perhaps in the wrong way, to give us assurance about how we um, show the quality of our results. And in the 1980s, these two gentlemen on the on the right hand side, Douglas Altman on the right and Martin Bland on the left, um, pictured here in 1981 in Cambridge, presented a paper about a more appropriate statistical method where the limits of agreement of, of two measurements could be determined based on how close they are to each other and what those differences are. And it's a very simple method in its simplest form by taking the mean of the two measurements across the method and the differences between the two methods and plotting them. We're back to where we started, the mean of the difference, the standard deviation of the differences, and then we're using confidence intervals. For my last slide, I really just wanted to show how everything we've talked about is intertwined, but how the, how the mean and the standard deviation as statistical concepts are littered throughout all of the different models that we use uh, within the laboratory. So mean standard deviation are in introduced ultimately to sigma and the total error approach, measurement uncertainty approach, quality control, method comparison studies as well. That's a real whistle stop tour. Um, I hope it's been useful. Um, if you want to find out any more, I, I will point you in the direction towards three of my websites that I have here. I will be following up this session with some posts on my site to summarise some of the points that I've mentioned. So please feel free to sign up and have a look. Um, and I look forward to seeing you in the following two uh, sessions. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um... Unfortunately, uh, what we would like to do um, just before, and I appreciate obviously Stephen has mentioned a few times about the next uh, session, 
uh, it will be on the 21st of November. Um, so we will be notifying everyone um, who attended today's one about it. So hopefully you can sign up and join us for that. <clears throat> if everyone who is still with us, if you could just help us out here, obviously it's really important for us and Stephen to get feedback you know, um, areas that you may be questions you have, especially the questions that unfortunately we won't be able to go through today. So if you could scan the QR code that you can currently see on the screen, and there is a section in which you can ask a question or give some of your feedback. Um, would like to thank uh, Stephen. Would you mind going back to your previous slide, Stephen, just so people can see where they can learn more? Um, if everyone, anyone has a mobile phone, you can obviously take a picture of that. Um, but as we just said, and we've been saying throughout, we will be, we have this recorded, we will be making this presentation available, not the slides, but a recording of the presentation. Um, and hopefully we will be able to have some good feedback and we look forward to seeing you um, on the 21st of November. Thank you very much, Stephen. I know you had a, uh, you had a battling with a cold right now, so the, the throat <laughs> and the nose and the plenty of water drinking it had to happen. Out. But um, I think we all we all got a bit of a statistical lesson and also history lesson. Um, so we appreciate that. It, it all adds up. And again, thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing everyone and hearing from everyone on the 21st of November. Thank you again, Stephen. Thank you.